Amanda has no idea why Rosvan's been acting cold since she broke his heart into a million pieces. Newcomers Shekinah and Gigachad might be the least relatable couple in the show's history. And is Nicola an incel? We have two new episodes to talk about it, so let's get into it, starting with Nicola. From the very beginning of the season, Misha's been asking Nicola, when am I going to meet your family? And since the beginning, Nicola's been very shy about it. Up until now, Nicola's had us believe that he's worried about introducing Misha to his family because they're very traditional and will judge the fact that she's been married before and she's not a virgin and not from the Holy Land, had two kids, you know, that sort of thing. So after them fighting about it all season long, having 10 conversations, when are we finally going to meet your family? Nicola finally agrees and says, you know what? It's gonna make me uncomfortable, it's gonna make me scared, I don't think it'll go well, but fine, I'll do what you want. Fine, I guess you can meet my family after dating for eight years before we get married, I guess I'll let that happen. Thank you, Nicola, for your terrible sacrifice. So after a whole season of buildup, they finally go to meet the family, his two brothers and his mom, and all hell breaks loose. Because they're actually really nice. They're chatting, they're sharing food, these two guys look identical and nothing like Nicola. Nicola sees all this and is like, well, that's just because they don't know what's going on with us yet. Once they find all that stuff out, you know, then it'll go badly. You'll see. So he tells them they met online, they've been together for like six or eight or 50 years, I don't know, and that they're hoping to get engaged in a month. They translate that to mom, and after a few tense moments, the mom is happy. Oh, thank God he's got married. He's, he's so old, he doesn't talk to any girls. Oh, finally, I can get him out of the house. I'm happy. Again, Nicola sees all this and goes, well, that's just because they don't know about the divorce and the two kids thing. Once they find out about that, then things go poorly. You'll see. So he tells them all that she wasn't always Catholic and tells them all that stuff. They translate for mom and after a few tense moments again, she says, so what? Oh my God, I'm so glad I can get him out of the house. You know, so what? It doesn't matter, you know, whether someone's been divorced or have two kids. It's fine, you know, we're not, we're not one to judge, you know, just please, please just go, just get out of the house. And now that the whole family has reacted nothing but positively to everything about their relationship, Misha and all of us slowly turn to Nicola and say, So, you were wrong. What's up with that? I will say there is a chance that maybe the family just put on a good show either for the cameras or just to save face. But the second they leave, they're all talking shit to each other and talking about how bad it is and how they don't really support it. We saw that with Jenny and Sumit on previous seasons, remember? The family finally agreed to let them marry, but pretty much as soon as Jenny left, they're like, no, fuck that girl. We're not gonna let her marry. She's so old. What are you talking about? That's really not the impression I got from his family. His mom seemed genuinely happy that, hey, as long as you can find anybody. And she seemed to be pretty realistic about his age and how he never talks to anyone so that this is probably a pleasant surprise for her. And the brothers even say like, yeah, I mean, we're cool with her. We wouldn't judge. But that Nicola might be worried that his family might view him, Nicola, as a less pious person for dating someone who's been divorced and with two kids and all that. So they seem to think that whatever fears and anxieties that Nicola had about Misha meeting his family weren't really about the family not accepting Misha, and wasn't about the family not accepting Nicola either, just that the family might not see him as such a religious person anymore. And for some reason that's more important to Nicola than whether or not his family accepts him for who he is, and supports the relationship and the person he loves. Or it could be option number three, which is he just doesn't like her that much and doesn't want to get married, and therefore doesn't want to introduce her to his family if they're not going to be together. They did have one more scene where Misha essentially asks him like, hey, so you were wrong. They didn't judge me for who I was. Are you sure this isn't something to do with you? Are you sure that you're not the one that has a problem with me being a divorcee? Are you sure this isn't your own bullshit that you're pulling? And this is how he responds. Is there anything in you that is bothered about my past? No. Nothing. Nothing, Misha. There's no part of you. No. Of course, this could always be edited or the producer tell him like, hey, look, look like you're lying. Look like you're really bad at lying. But if this is his actual response, then come on, you're not fooling anyone, man. If you've ever asked your partner, does this dress make me look fat? Then you know that this kind of response is bullshit. Oh, that dress uh, look fat? Uh, no, no, you don't, you don't look fat. Uh, no, no, not at all. Yeah, I'm not buying it. If I was in Nicola's position and my partner had a genuine insecurity or worry about whether or not I was judging them based off their identity or their past, I would jump out of my seat to reassure them that, no, 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 I don't care at all about that stuff. You know, I know that you might be worried about it and I understand, but no, to me, I don't care. I love you for who you are. It really doesn't bother me at all. I would not go, um, no, I don't, I don't care. Doesn't, doesn't bother me. No. Mm. I suspect it's not a black and white thing with him. 
It's easy to think that either he has a huge problem with it or he doesn't have a problem with it at all, but it does go against his religious beliefs and we know that that's very important to him. So I'd imagine he's somewhere in the middle where he maybe doesn't want to care that much or he's accepted that or tried to accept it long ago, but it does still kind of bother him and he just doesn't want to make that a big deal or something like that. You're telling me that the entire season, Nicola's mom has been made out to be a monster by Nicola and she's actually a little sweetie pie? His behavior and thought process is very strange, especially considering his family seems very open and understanding. It's almost like he wanted the visit to be a failure. If his family has been consistently loving and open throughout his life, then why would he be so afraid of his family not accepting him for who he was? It's also interesting that his two brothers look to be a very similar age and Nico looks to be quite a bit older. So I wonder if there is something in their family dynamic where maybe now things are pretty nice and cool, but maybe growing up things were kind of dicey for a while and he learns that he's maybe just gotta have that distance with his family maybe. And as nice and caring as they all seemed in that scene, it's somewhat rare for someone to grow up feeling like their family is untrustworthy or not very nice or judgmental in some way, and it not be based on something, even if it's something that we don't see. He just hates women. I really don't see one redeeming quality in him. All this scene did was confirm he's an incel, except instead of blaming women like most do, he blames his mom and family. I know this isn't the point, but I think incels blame their moms a lot too, don't they? I think if Nicola grew up in an American culture and acted the same way, then I would get a lot more incel vibes like other people are getting. But when you add in the culture and the religion, even if his family is more open than he is, it just becomes a little bit less clear to me. Normally I like to sum up my feelings and give one possible explanation that usually isn't as extreme as what the internet is saying, but frankly I don't have one and that doesn't mean that I think he necessarily hates women, although he might, I don't, I don't know. I just don't really understand his motivations other than he's probably a little hurt by her past and probably doesn't love that and has no relationship experience so he's just a little terrible with emotions and kind of uh, entitled and condescending and rude and uncaring. Does him being a 46 year old virgin and completely inexperienced explain why he acts like an annoying 14 year old in a relationship? Maybe it does. Maybe there's something, I, I, I don't know. Let's move on. All my girls bad, doing bad things. Big Birkin bags, big cars and big brains. Shakina, Shanika, what's her name? Shakina. Like, uh, anyway, I think a lot of the problems that come from judging a book by its cover comes from the assumption that your judgment must be correct. I might take one look at Shekinah and already have different ideas about who I think she must be or what her values are, but if she shows me something else, then I have to be open-minded and go, okay, well, my first impressions were wrong. So I'm not saying that she is like this, but uh, she does seem like uh, quite the stereotype. Though she did grow up Amish, so I guess that's kind of cool. A lot of the things we've already seen fit to kind of stereotypical mold with her of a very LA person who really values appearance to other people and maybe not necessarily the natural kind of appearance. Seems to be pretty affluent and hanging out with a lot of expensive and kind of snobby looking people. Yeah, this is probably not someone that I would relate to or enjoy being around in person. Probably. I don't know about you, but when I meet someone that has like 10 stereotypical traits of one particular kind of person, I usually think that I must be getting pranked. Just because someone has all the hair and the makeup and all the plastic surgeries, surely that doesn't mean they're actually like that kind of person, right? Like there's no way that this person is actually that stereotypical and then also hangs out with everyone you would expect them to and talks like you would expect them to and then also goes after the guys you would expect them to. Really creepy looking steroid up guys who have a lot of surgeries and makeup and brag about how many girls they've been with. There's no way that it's all those things at once, right? But uh, sometimes stereotypes are true for a reason? Come on, we've got Giga Chat over here, a French accent, a turtleneck. Are these real people? Is, is this real? It also makes me wonder, given her seeming affluence, why she's on the show at all. There is no way someone who cares so much about appearance and clout would be so stereotypical that they would go on a show like this just for the attention and notoriety and social media followings. Would they? I don't know. To me, this is like the most unrelatable couple I've ever seen on the show, so I don't really know who's going to be enjoying this. But I mean, I guess we'll see what happens. Shakina ruins the show. All the couples are everyday folk and they added in some rich LA people who I feel used connections or money to get on the spot on the show. She's more E material than 90 Day and that says a lot. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good way of putting that. Everyone in her storyline looks like they moved to LA and bought entirely new faces for the sole purpose of auditioning for Bravo reality TV shows. Damn, <laughs> damn. What in the silver twins is going on with her lips? Oh man. 30 percenters pretend to be one percenters. Oh my gosh. I guess I don't know what I expected, but damn guys. 
when you order Kylie Jenner on Wish. Oh no. Oh man. Like I said, when she presents and has so many characteristics of a certain stereotype, and then everything else we see further supports that stereotype, then you're going to get people assuming more things about that stereotype, that they must be dumb or they must be really mean people or have no morals or, you know, just get really nasty like that. That's the kind of area that I don't really want to go. You know, I, I can stick to having fun about uh, how, I mean, that guy, he looks ridiculous. He does look like a cartoon character. Maybe he's not a bad guy. Maybe he donates his time to the children, infants on his weekends or, you know, he might, whatever. But I mean, lastly, we have Amanda and Rosvan. Rosvan thought that things between him and Amanda were getting better recently and was extra surprised and very hurt by a terrible argument that they had last night, which was apparently not caught on camera. It sounds like they kind of broke up in it, and Amanda said that they just weren't right for each other. She had apparently unfavorably compared him to her late husband, saying that you're not half the man that my ex was or something like that, and did something along the lines of accusing him that while he's figuring out his acting and his TikTok career or whatever he's doing, that he doesn't seem like the sort of guy who would work the janitor job to help support his family while he was pursuing his dream, and instead is the kind of guy to just only think about himself and not think about his family. Which is a pretty hurtful thing to say. I just don't think you're the kind of guy that would provide for his family. Yeah, I don't think you would really give a shit. I don't think, you know, you're just going to do your own thing. So they talk about it the next day where he tells her like, hey, you said some pretty hurtful things last night. And he's like, yo, you're being judgmental. And I told you from the very beginning exactly what I'm like. And you agreed to that. So now all of a sudden you're flip flopping on me and telling me that you don't like who I am. And you're wishing you were with Jason again. That's not fair. And you're hurting my feelings. But even after being confronted with, hey, this is what you did and this is how it made me feel, she kind of, I mean, she doesn't really, she kind of apologizes. You understand? Yeah, it's like not fair for you. And I'm sorry if like, I hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. It's like pulling teeth the way she's trying to take accountability. At the very least, if I'm Rosvan, I'm not feeling any better from this. But what really rubs me the wrong way is she just doesn't have any warmth. Her partner's crying over something that she did to him that I think they both understand that she's in the wrong for. But she's like, well, yeah, I, I thought I thought that. Like, like what, as if she's saying, like, whatever, dude, what, what did I do wrong? Because you told me so many things different. Okay. In, whole, in I, this whole I time. I felt that way. She then has this huge epiphany where she realizes that maybe after her husband died, she maybe rushed into things and is a little scared of being in a relationship. And we can have some compassion for her and say, yeah, that makes sense. And it is normal for you to not necessarily know exactly where you are in that process. But when you involve yourself with another intimate relationship, now your lack of self-awareness and understanding is impacting someone else. If you start a relationship with someone and you have a certain amount of emotional expectations with them and you tell them how you want to be together and you won't tell them how you like them for who they are and then you change your mind all of a sudden and realize that you were wrong from the very starts because you hadn't processed your own stuff, we might be able to understand that you didn't do these things and hurt these people deliberately, but you still hurt people. And it's still your responsibility to own your emotions. So while I can commend her for recognizing this now and being vulnerable, if I was Rosvan in this situation, I'd still be mad. I'd be like, yeah, great, I understand. You know, I I'm sorry for that, but c come on, it's a little too little too late, isn't it? And they end the discussion, then both agreeing that they both need to take some time and figure out what they really want. Are they broken up with? Are they getting back together now that they kind of know where the source of the argument was? Or do they think, no, we shouldn't do this, we should just split off completely? That's important to note that that's where the conversation ends, because we still have a few more scenes to go. It's the next day now, or something, and they're driving to meet Rosvan's parents, which is pretty bad timing now, and Amanda reveals to us that she thinks she's realizing that her past traumas and grief might be causing some problems in the relationship. I am realizing my past trauma and my grief may have caused issues in our relationship. Makes sense. But one problem I'm consistently noticing with Amanda is that there's a pretty large gap between when she thinks about what's going on and how she feels, and then how this affects other people. Because even now she's likely going through this mental thing and processing and oh, you know, it's because I, I guess I'm not really over Jason and I guess that's complicating things and I'm conflicted. And that's all good. But then she tells him like, you know, I guess it's been hard with me with Jason, but I still love you and I want to be in a relationship. But also, I don't want us to break up. Good for her for knowing how she feels, but I don't get the impression that she's aware of how this now complicates things for Rosvan more. Because so now Rosvan's like, oh, well, does that mean I'm going to deal with this for the whole relationship? Like, what, is, what does this actually mean? Okay, I understand. It's not great that I do this to you. And I'm sorry for that. Obviously, this is just something, like, I am working through and, like, trying to deal with. 
Okay, that still might be correct, Amanda, but what about anything outside of your own head? Because you can say, I understand that I shouldn't be like this and you know, we're going to have to deal with it. But outside of how this situation relates to you, what does this mean for Razvan? What does this mean about your relationship? Do you want to continue working on this grieving process while in a relationship? Do you see how that might pan out in the future and how you might actually make that work and Razvan and you will be happy together? Or, and what it seems like to me, she might just be kind of like, yeah, you know, I guess it's hard with Jason, but I like you. Okay, we don't need the internal monologue of how you feel. I mean, that's a good place to start, but let's start connecting here. And if we think about it from Razvan's perspective, if I was in his situation, I'd be pretty afraid right now. I'd be hurt from the fight before, insecure because now I don't really know how much she actually likes me and I don't know how much of her word I am able to believe. And even now when she reaches out to hold his arm and try to show him some affection, I'd probably kind of recoil at it. Like, I, I don't know, you're trying to support me and I get that, but I don't know if I should let the support in. I don't know if I'm safe enough to let my guard down around you because you could hurt me again. And as he withdraws a little bit, Amanda picks up on that and then gets a little bit more nervous herself. Rosman has never acted like this to me before. He's being very cold, distant, not really showing me any sort of like affection. Yeah, if you sense distance, that's because you pushed him away by hurting his feelings. So when he says, oh, I need to go take a nap, I need to get out of here, she then does this. You know that I know you are upset and hurt, but also, like, I feel like if you want to be with me, like, and we're going to be together, then you can't just, like, stay like this. And I know it's gonna, like, take time, but I'm just saying, like, I'm putting in an effort and I hope that you do too. There's different ways to interpret that, but mm, I'd be, if I was Rosvan, like, mm, I'd be so mad. If it were me, I'd be thinking, I've been nothing but good and patient and supportive to you this whole time while you deal with things. And in return, you're hot and cold, lead me on and said some really hurtful things last night. And now that I'm hurt by the hurtful things you did and scared to even be in a relationship with you anymore, I can't even feel bad for six hours until you go, hey, you know, if you want this to work, then you kind of got to not be upset forever. You know, you see that I'm trying, right? Which kind of sounds like, hey, I know that I hurt your feelings, but that was like yesterday. Why are you still mad? You see I'm trying, right? Why, why are you still mad if I'm trying? Like, shouldn't I just get what I want already? I know that I'm failing the tests, but at least like I did the tests and like showed up to class. Doesn't that mean I should be rewarded for that? Maybe that's not what she meant, but that's how it sounded to me. On the nicer side, maybe she was just being genuine and saying, hey, I, I am trying, you know, I'm sorry that you're upset, but I hope that we can work on this together and, you know, come out the other side, okay? It sounded like she kind of ended what she was saying like that, but the first half seemed a lot more blaming. Throughout the season, Amanda's been criticized for a lot of things, actually. But one of them has been this sort of entitled 16-year-old kind of feeling. Like she doesn't really understand how her actions or words or emotions impact other people and kind of sees things all from her perspective. And I do agree that it looks like that. I mean, that's how I would feel if I was Rosvan. She does come off as pretty selfish in a lot of her scenes. And although she may just be a selfish person, and this may just be a pattern that she's had throughout her whole life, it totally could be, I will say that something like grief can really preoccupy your emotional systems in a way that makes it harder for you to engage in empathy with other people. You only have so much emotional energy in your life, and if half or 75% of your emotional energy bucket is preoccupied with the background processing of how do I feel, what's going on with me, how do I feel about this, then it does leave less left over to then think like, oh yeah, yeah, and, and that's how someone else would feel. Yeah, I totally forgot to think about how someone else would feel. So I don't know how much of this selfish kind of behavior is her and her core personality versus how much of it is her and how much of it is her current life circumstances. So while we can be compassionate for that and not jump to labeling her as this evil demon woman lady, we can also acknowledge that the effects are the same. She's being irresponsible with her emotions in a way that hurts someone she cares about. And even when she tries to apologize and connect with him, she still seems fairly disconnected in a way that, if I were Ras von Schuh's, would continue to do damage to me. And that's just not cool. That's selfish. That's a selfish way of thinking. Now let's see what the internet has to say. And uh, I'm sure it will be much meaner than what I just said. Anyone else notice Red Flag Amanda? <laughs> really? Red Flag Amanda? Only became affectionate and kind to Razvan after he started to call her out on her BS? While that is a tool that abusers will do, abusers will be very mean and hurtful in their relationships, and then once the person is battered, then they'll be all kind and caring and, oh, I never meant it, I'm gonna get better, in a way that really sucks them back in to continue the cycle of abuse. While that does happen, I don't think that she's a master manipulator, like this post is saying. 
I think she's just preoccupied with her own shit and honestly, just not the brightest. He's not being affectionate anymore at all. WTF, you literally just told him he wasn't the right person for you. How else should he be responding? When you look at a child, whether they're, you know, five years old or even like 12, they might do some bullshit and yell and scream and be really annoying. And then when their parent gets mad at them or doesn't give them what they want, the kid will feel bad and be like, oh, well, you know, you, you don't love me anymore. And while children are capable of doing that purposely to manipulate their parents, even if they don't necessarily know that's what they're doing, it's also a very normal reaction. You know, even if you're being an asshole, if someone was being nice to you before and now they're not, you're still going to feel bad, even if it's completely justified. So I guess the question is how much of what we're seeing from Amanda is deliberate and conscious in a way meant to manipulate Rosvon versus how much of it might just be a reaction and her being just not that bright. Again, if I'm Rosvon, doesn't matter which one it is, but it is a real question. And the winner of this season's most clueless villain, she absolutely obliterated Rosvon's heart into pieces and then looks confused when he doesn't want to be touchy-feely with her. She needs to stop playing with his feelings, go home, and finish dealing with the loss that she clearly still needs time to process. Yeah. Even if she's not playing with his feelings on purpose, kind of is what she's doing. She needs to go home, hang out with her family, and get some therapy and find herself before annoying other people. What a nice and snarky way of summarizing exactly what I'm trying to say. That's it for today's video, and let me know in the comments what you thought about any of these couples. And if you liked the video, make sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, ring the bell for notifications, and every comment helps the algorithm. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.